Hello, everyone. My name is Ahmed Mohammed. I am head of civic engagement and public education at New Pride Agenda. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have a special event, um, and I'm really excited to be um, passing it off to our moderator and board member, Dan Teets. Um, but before I do so, I'd like to note that this program will be recorded and posted to our website and YouTube pages. Um, and I'd also like to mention our upcoming town hall. Um, in the end of May on redistricting and the impact of newly drawn congressional lines on LGBTQ New Yorkers and our priorities. So please keep an eye out for more details. Um, but without further ado, exciting event, like I mentioned. So Dan Teets, the floor is yours. Um, and yeah, I'll see you guys at the end. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ahmed. Um, I'm, uh, as Ahmed said, I'm Dan Teets. I'm a board member at New Pride Agenda. And I'm so happy that all of you could join us today uh, together with uh, Congressman uh, Mondaire Jones. Um, just a brief, uh, a, a brief word on the new Pride Agenda is a statewide LGBTQ plus nonprofit focused on education and advocacy, particularly as it relates to the G TGNC and non-binary members of our community and black and brown queer folk and others who are most vulnerable in New York's LGBTQ community. Over the past year, NPA has hosted some 20 bi-monthly virtual town halls focused on a range of topics from COVID-19 to police accountability and reform, all of which can be found on NPA's website. Uh, over the next several months, I think we can look forward to NPA expanding its presence across New York State via a Western New York upstate organizer and a new executive director leading to more exciting and necessary work. Um, so let me now just introduce Mondaire, um, or Congressman Jones. I should be a little, little more formal here, maybe. Um, so Mondaire Jones was first elected last year to serve New York's 17th Congressional District, which encompasses all of Rockland County and the central and northern parts of Westchester. I'm going to let Mondaire in a few minutes just do his own sort of childhood story, which I think really connects well with the issues that he's working on. And then we're going to talk about some today. Um, so I'm going to skip to his college education. It's really terrible. He went to Stanford and Harvard Law. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's an embarrassment of riches, I guess. Um, and I'm going to let him talk a little bit about that too, because I think some of his early work really connects well with his service now on, among other things, the House Judiciary Committee. Um, prior to running for Congress, Representative Jones worked as a litigator in private practice, uh, where he was awarded the Legal Aid Society of New York uh, 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 for his pro bono service. Um, uh, in his work in Congress, um, he's certainly focused on civil rights and civil liberties, um, important to our community. Um, um, it's fought hard for COVID-19 relief, a living wage for all, universal ch uh, child care, um, the restoration of the state and local tax deduction, um, all of which are important to his district and to New Yorkers. Um, and he's the freshman representative to leadership in the 117th Congress, youngest uh, in the leadership at 33 years of age. Um, um, that means he spends a lot of time with Speaker Pelosi, and we're going to talk about that for a minute too today. Um, uh, representative Jones was raised in Rockland County and currently resides in White Plains. So, um, Representative Jones, feel free to, to, to get us rolling. Well, well, thank you so much, Dan, for that generous introduction and, and thank you to New Pride Agenda for inviting me to speak with you today. You know, after hearing about all of the impactful initiatives that your organization has taken up, especially those which serve LGBTQ plus people of color, who as you know, historically have been overlooked in our LGBTQ equality movement, I feel honored to be part of this conversation today. Uh, you heard a little bit about my upbringing I will add that I was raised by an incredible single mother who worked multiple jobs just to make ends meet. Uh, and she got help raising me from my grandparents. My grandfather was a janitor and my grandmother cleaned homes. And when daycare was too expensive, she took me to work with her. Um, but for most of my life, and until recently, I never imagined that someone like me could run for Congress, let alone get elected. As I said in my floor speech on the Equality Act a few months ago, to grow up poor, black, and gay is to not see yourself anywhere. It is also to feel completely unseen. And until recent years, I thought that if I were to come out as gay, 
there would be no way I could win an election in my district. Uh, but here I am, along with my friend Richie Torres, the first openly gay Black member of Congress, fighting to affirm equality and equity for every member of our beautifully diverse LGBTQ plus community and our families. At a time when LGBTQ plus rights and trans rights in particular are under attack, it is as important as ever that we fight back and declare that LGBTQ plus rights are human rights. Everyone deserves to live free of oppression regardless of how they identify or who they love. I came to Congress determined to achieve equality and equity for LGBTQ plus people everywhere which is why I was so proud to take an important first step in that direction by helping to pass the Equality Act in the House. Uh, one of my own bills, the Juror Non-Discrimination Act, was included in this landmark legislation. Our constitution guarantees the right to trial by a jury of one's peers, but LGBTQ plus defendants are deprived of that right when attorneys use sexual orientation or gender identity to dismiss jurors. By banning discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity in jury selection, my bill will ensure that LGBTQ plus people will no longer be excluded from our legal system simply because of who they are or who they love. We must take a holistic systemic view of what it means to be queer in the United States of America. And as I have said, we must think not only about equality, but also about equity. I'll tell you what that means. Uh, LGBTQ plus youth, for example, are twice as likely to become homeless. LGBTQ plus individuals have on average $16,000 more in student debt. A lot of people don't know that. The cost of PrEP and other prescription drugs, many of them life-saving, make necessary medical care out of reach for too many people in our community. And we know that black and brown LGBTQ plus youth are at an increased risk of abuse and neglect, which is why I am co-leading a bill called the Protecting LGBTQ plus Youth Act, along with Congressman David Scott and Richie Torres. Our bill would help bring an end to the abuse and neglect far too many LGBTQ plus youth face by incentivizing government agencies to research ways to protect LGBTQ plus youth from abuse and neglect expand demographic information collected in child abuse reports to include sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, and it would train personnel to meet the unique needs of LGBTQ plus youth. In doing so, our bill will ensure that every child has the opportunity not only to survive, but to thrive. And my work won't end there. Investments in affordable housing, student loan forgiveness and universal health care are all issues of LGBTQ plus justice. So I'm gonna continue pushing for legislation and policies at the federal level that advance justice and equity for LGBTQ plus people. And finally, I just wanna say thanks to the tireless work of advocates like all of you, including you, Dan, because, because of your work, life is better for people like me. Uh, as difficult as my childhood was, I'm still a 33 year old member of Congress and life was far worse for the generations before mine. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I love being a leader in our movement now to make life better for the generations that come after us. So our work is far from over and we've got to keep working to create a world where every person and every family can thrive exactly as they are. Uh, so thank you again. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Um, thanks, Mondo. That was a great start. And in fact, you covered some of our, our, our first topic area, which was, which was around the Equality Act, which I think maybe, unless you've got more you'd like to say in that, I think I may scoop past to the to another topic, but I, I did want to note also that you're a deputy whip for the Progressive Caucus and you're a co-chair of the LGBT Caucus. And my suspicion is you may be the youngest member for each of those too, um, um, uh, which is kind of fun. Um, we're gonna we're gonna scoot back to the your your role as a as the freshman rep in the leadership a little bit later. But I wanted to turn to um, you know I think some subjects which re relate well to your remarks just now. The January 6th insurrection at the Capitol, um, you know, right after you all were sworn in, um, uh, had to have been horrifying for a whole host of reasons that we all share, but then your particular circumstance uh, as, a, as a new member of, of the body. Um, uh, you know, I'm going to tie a bunch of things together here and then have you talk on them all, I guess. 
So President Biden's remarks last week in the in his joint address uh, to the to the Congress, he re remarked on restoring faith in, in our democracy and improving it still works to deliver for the people. Um, HR one for the People Act, which I think fits in there as well, right? Which is looking at, among other things, voting rights and, and ensuring people have access to the ballot. Um, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, um, similarly, which really is, among other things, repudiating Shelby v. Holder. Um, uh, assaults on the right to vote that are happening right now all across the country. I mean, horrible laws, new laws um, passed, signed into law in both Georgia and Florida and on the verge of the same in Texas. Um, the third reconstruction, which you wrote about recently in the Washington Post and spoken about elsewhere, I'd love for you to tie all of these together. And then the expansion of SCOTUS, the expansion of the Supreme Court membership from nine to 13 members. I think these are all of a piece. And if you could talk for a bit on, on that. I so appreciate your recognition that these things are interrelated because they all bear on the question of our democracy, which is ailing today. I think back to the January 6th insurrection that I and many of my colleagues, hundreds of my colleagues nearly died in at the Capitol. Uh, that, that violent uh, white supremacist domestic terrorism uh, that we all live through, including millions of Americans watching on television all, all across the country. Uh, it began as a myth, a big lie, if you will, a mm -hmm. uh, mass voter fraud that did not actually happen. Uh, and of course, no one can ever substantiate these allegations of mass voter fraud in, in connection with the, with the presidential election of last year. And, uh, the, the allegations were never meant to be substantiated. Um, it was always meant to lay the foundation for another decade of racist voter suppression, like what we are seeing now in Georgia, in Florida, and soon enough in Texas. To, to your point about the Supreme Court, for all the accolades that Justice Roberts has gotten for being uh, a so-called moderate on the bench, uh, it was the Roberts Court that decided Shelby v. Holder. Yeah. which gutted the heart of the Voting Rights Act uh, and uh, allowed what we saw in Georgia to occur. Uh, it would have been the case that prior to the Shelby decision, a state like Georgia with his history of racist voter suppression would have had to go to the Department of Justice as part of a preclearance process in order for SB202 to, to, take, uh, to become law. Um, so too, many jurisdictions throughout this country, including Southern states, but not limited to Southern states, mm -hmm. um, we are seeing in the year 2021, uh, with respect to the party of Donald Trump, uh, a party that cannot meet, uh, that cannot compete successfully on the merits of its policy ideas. And so instead it seeks to disenfranchise large swaths of the American electorate uh, in order to, to stay in power. Um, and HR1, also known as S1, now that it's in the Senate before the People Act, uh, is of foundational democracy saving importance. If we do not pass HR1, we will not have a democracy. Uh, I, it is no exaggeration to say that. Not, not given the many hundreds of voter suppression bills that have been proposed in now 43 and counting different states in the union, some of which have already become law. HR1 uh, would, through automatic voter registration, enfranchise an additional 50 million people nationally. Through independent redistricting commissions, mandatory independent redistricting commissions, uh, it would end the practice of partisan gerrymandering of congressional districts, uh, which as of now allows for QAnon conspiracy theorists and other fringe elements uh, to coast to victory in general election contests simply because they've prevailed in their Republican primaries. That is a distortion of our democracy when someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene is allowed to win a general election contest. The, the, the median American voter would repudiate her. In a general and at the ballot box, but, but not so because of the way these districts have been drawn. Uh, and of course, independent campaign financing is another key provision, one of many key provisions in, in the For the People Act. Uh, we will get better people in Congress when we enact these provisions. Uh, independent campaign financing would allow more working class people and more diverse people, including LGBTQ+, uh, including people of color, including more women, to have a fighting chance. You know, I say this as someone who was the exception to the rule, right. right? I had a number of people running against me with inordinate amounts of wealth, one of whom uh, uh, 
a billionaire heir to a pharmaceutical fortune who, who spent $5.4 million to essentially buy a congressional seat, most of which, the vast majority of which was, was his own money or his dad's money. Um, and, and, and it was an exception to the rule that someone like me, uh, you know, and with my public service job at the time and very little savings, was able to, was able to prevail on that crowded eight person democratic primary up in Westchester and Rockland counties. Uh, where people never imagined that, that uh, someone of color could represent this district and running on a progressive platform and being openly gay and black on top of that. Uh, and so I'm grateful to have been able to expand people's imagination of what is possible, but now we have to make sure that other people have a fighting chance in our democracy. That's when we'll get a truly representative democracy. And so on the question of SCOTUS, and I did introduce the Judiciary Act of 2021, which has been co-sponsored uh, by uh, the chairman of the um, the House Judiciary Committee, Jerry Nadler, and the chair of the House Subcommittee on the Courts, Hank Johnson, uh, because we have a 6-3 now majority, so even more right wing than the court, the 5-4 court that decided Shelby v. Holder, uh, we could not count on that court to uphold the John Lewis Voting Rights Act when we, when we enact that in the, in the House and the, in the Senate, right? We need, we need a majority on the court that is committed to protecting the fundamental right to vote uh, and unfortunately, you've got too many people on the court who um, have never seen a voter suppression law that they that they had a problem with. Uh, and so that's why we have to add four seats. We've done it before seven times in our history. We've changed the size of the Supreme Court, including in several instances to defeat white supremacy. And now we've got to do it again by adding four seats to the court so we can restore balance to that institution and save our democracy. Let me ask, um, just to say a little bit more around your recent column in the Post on the third reconstruction. And you, you cited three elements in particular, and some of which you've just mentioned now. But, but, but talk a little bit about why you view this as the, as the need for opportunity for potentially a third reconstruction. The first two being, of course, the original in the 1870s, um, which was followed by I don't know, you know, a century of Jim Crow really out of control. But the second being after the Civil Rights Acts passed in the 60s um, um, and then retrenchment, right? I think I would view, you know, Reagan on through Gingrich and friends um, uh, and Trump is the natural result of that really. Um, so, so talk a little bit about your, your view on the third reconstruction. Twice before we have tried to build a multiracial democracy in this country. Uh, and twice before, despite significant gains and progress, uh, there has been backlash uh, to the point where we have ultimately been unsuccessful. And now it is time for a third reconstruction uh, where once and all, once and for all, we can build that multiracial democracy. But that means that we must, uh, we must enact structural changes to ensure that everyone who is eligible in this country has the right has the ability to exercise uh, the, the right to vote at the ballot box, uh, that, uh, that, that people don't have polling locations closed in, in their neighborhoods because they're black or brown or young or working class, um, that, that people aren't uh, for the rest of their lives deprived of the right to vote simply because they've done time in, uh, in, in prison or in jail or, or, or because they've been convicted of something. Um, where, where, where people, uh, are, are able to vote in a pandemic without risking their lives. I mean, th these, are, these are problems that should not exist in a civilized society. Um, but unfortunately, we have uh, a, a, a party um, that is increasingly committed to minority rule, um, who, uh, you know, with, with the base feels threatened by my very existence and, and your existence and many other yeah. um, And it's, it's, it, it, it can feel sometimes dramatic to say, but, that, but there can be no doubt that that is true. Every day we have evidence of that. Uh, Liz Cheney today seems poised to lose yes. her position here at the Republican caucus simply for saying, hey guys, would you please stop lying about the presidential election last year being stolen? Um, it is extraordinary what is happening in this country. And at the same time, as, as someone who is, a, uh, is part of the most diverse freshman class per capita probably in American history, yeah. um, 
who is a history maker in his own right, along with my friend Richie Torres and so many other members of the freshman class, I know that we can achieve a multiracial democracy, but only if we fight for it. Only if, as our predecessors did, activists and elected officials of good conscience, uh, we use our power, our influence, our voices, our, our financial resources, and so many other things uh, to, to bend the arc of the moral universe towards justice uh, in a way that is permanent and that has lasting effect. And that also means we have to abolish the Jim Crow filibuster. <laughs> Yes, I'm so glad. It's funny you should say that because it was. I just wrote it down a, a moment ago to say to, to ask you about that. But yeah, I just wanted to remark. See, you mentioned um, Liz Cheney and then uh, your fellow New Yorker, um, Elise Stefanik, uh, who seems poised to replace her on that you know third leadership position among Republicans in the House. I just think it's in a remarkable moment. When Liz Cheney, I think it's probably fair to say that both of us find most of her views reprehensible, and I don't care what it, what it is, could be the economy, could be LGBTQ, could just go down the list, reprehensible. When Liz Cheney is the person we're now looking to, to save, if you will, save her own party from itself, is, is an extraordinary thing, to, right? I mean, just the sky has fallen um, when we think that Liz Cheney's the good person in this conversation. Um, when you've got other uh, fellow freshmen uh, like Marjorie Taylor Greene, like Lauren Boebert, um, and you've got old timers, shall we say, um, like Elise Stefanik, like Louis Gomer. Um, so speaking of racist trash, um, um, DC statehood. So you got in a little dust up recently um, um, when you made remarks on the house floor with regard to the vote um, on DC statehood, which passed the house and is now on its way to the Senate. Um, talk a little bit about, about what, what, what was going on there. You know, for the duration of this year thus far, uh, my colleagues, both in committee and on the House floor, on the other side of the aisle, uh, will just say the, the worst things imaginable about various groups of people. Uh, from the undocumented, to the black and brown people, uh, to LGBTQ plus people. I mean, I, I'm, I'm nervous about telling you to go and look at some of the, and listen to some of the statements made during deliberation on the Equality Act on the House floor. It's just gutting to hear uh, at, at times um, how hateful people can be. Uh, and so here we are in the midst of uh, trying to enfranchise 700,000 people in the, in the District of Columbia, uh, the majority of whom are black and brown, a population that is larger than uh, uh, Wyoming and, and, and Vermont. Uh, and, and folks over in the Senate and in the House, let's start with Tom Cotton, who said that, mm. um, that well, Wyoming is a, a well-rounded working class state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, 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 there's nothing obligating us to take that seriously when on its face it sounds ridiculous. Uh, and it's Tom Cudd, who's like, obviously a racist. Um, and, uh, and, and then you've got uh, over in the house, you know, people saying, well, they don't have a, they don't have a land for it. So how could they become a state? Uh, and this has been a, a fight that has been going on for generations, right? The idea that 700,000 people um, are, are being denied voting representation in the House of Representatives. Uh, and it is something that you know, I got fed up, along with many of my colleagues, of, of, of hearing terrible excuses for it that were not good faith excuses. And so I said, hey, uh, this is what Tom, this is what the Senator said. This is what the House member said. Isn't it, isn't it odd that there are so many syllables in the, <laughs> in the word white? Yeah. Why not just be honest and say the reason you don't want to enfranchise these people is because they're black and you don't like the way they would vote if they were to have a voting representation in Congress. It seems rather self-evident, but they took enormous offense. I think it's interesting how they took offense at being called racist as opposed to just being racist. But that, that somehow seems fine, um, but being called racist seems not fine. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's classic. I, I really, 
you know, I you will you, you will like hear oftentimes, you know, Tucker Carlson is, is another great example, right? He's like literally on television doing entire segments devoted to you know white replacement theory and just sort of like inflaming and naming white nationalism and like white grievance. Um, but like, don't dare call him the R word um, because uh, that's like the worst thing you could call someone. Well, like, don't be the worst thing you met. Uh, you know, we have to we have to speak truth to power and name things for what they are if, if words that are still have meaning today. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk a, a bit about the prospects for some of the pieces of legislation we've just now talked about across the other side of the building um, in the Senate. So HR1, S1, um, um, the Equality Act, uh, frankly, say for the bits that can be done via reconciliation, um, which we're not going to spend time on today because that's a little it's too hard to do in our brief talk. But just just for noting that, you know, unless they have some direct budget impact that the parliament the parliamentarian in the Senate can tolerate, they won't pass except essentially by supermajority. Nothing passes in the Senate without at least 60 members. And so as in the House, the Senate is even tighter. What do you think the prospects are of, I think one of any of the these key pieces of legislation that President Biden's agenda and your agenda as well, a passing in the Senate in any form that looks like what they just passed in the House without the filibuster going away. And for that matter, what do you think is the likelihood that the filibuster is either reformed or eliminated? Well, let me start by saying that there is nothing democratic about the small d democratic about the, yeah. the filibuster. I mean, it is uh, anything that would require a supermajority is not something that is is meant to uh, reflect the the popular will. Uh, you know, it was it was some it is the filibuster is not something that is in, in, in our mention at all in our constitution. It is well, it has quite a really, history. It has, yeah, it is a significant racist history. I mean, having been used to block civil rights legislation, now here we are, uh, it being used to block the Equality Act, which would enshrine protections for the LGBTQ and federal anti discrimination law, um, and, and the $15 minimum wage, despite it being overwhelmingly popular, and, and just common sense measures to end gun violence, as we uh, have now experienced well over 140 uh, mass shootings since the beginning of this year, if you can believe that. Um, we're so numb to it. Um, you know, and, and so uh, we we must uh, reform at a minimum the filibuster. And I think that as we continue to build momentum around that and show to the American people and to senators, who, Democratic senators, who for some reason still believe that Republicans are interested in, 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 in engaging in good faith uh, to the extent of 10 of them being willing in the Senate to, to vote on something that Democrats, um, you know, that, that actually they're mistaken. Uh, and, and obviously we mean people like Cinema and Manchin and maybe a handful of others hiding behind them who also didn't vote to overrule the parliamentarian to give everyone the ability to live in dignity yeah. in this country with yeah. the federal, um, despite what their constituents want. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I do predict that soon George Floyd Justice and Policing Act will, will pass. Um, and uh, I... I think more than anything, uh, you know, a lot of this discussion is moot if we don't pass HR1 because in order for Democrats to even have majorities in the face yeah. of the, the vote that we have seen, uh, we, must, we must secure the right to vote for people in this country. And so yeah, I, I am- Yeah, go ahead. So I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, to the majority leader's statements and Hedian Sun a, a couple of Sundays ago, that, that there will be a, uh, uh, a, a resolution on on this for the People Act, uh, in, in in or around August, um, especially as we as we prepare to, to go into re a redistricting year, and these independent redistricting commissions have to get set up, and other provisions have to get set up. Yeah, to your point with regard to Joe Manchin in West Virginia, one of the poorest states in the country, one of the lowest median incomes in the country, one of the highest poverty rates in the country, and yet um, won't do something about the filibuster to support his own constituents, which is, I think, pretty incredible. Um, I think we're lucky here um, in a variety of ways, not least, as you mentioned a few times, uh, to have uh, fellow House member Richie Torres in the, in the freshman class. And of course, Senate Majority Leader is a New Yorker, lives a few blocks from me here um, uh, uh, in Park Slope. So um, I, I think we're hopeful that, that this is gonna keep getting pushed. 
Let me talk a little bit about though, speaking of narrow majorities, um, redistricting, um, which is you know, gonna happen before your next election. Um, you're a newcomer. Um, New York is gonna lose a seat in that. So speaking of the house, um, uh, house seats is gonna lose a seat. Um, uh, I might prefer that uh, in redrawing those lines that say 21 and 22 were all carved up and, um, you know, Lee Stefanik and Claudia Tenney had to go at each other, but it, talk a little bit about the importance of redistricting and how it gets done and, and, and maybe, maybe make this a bit more, uh, not just nationally focused, but New York focused. Um, thoughts on that? Uh, and of course, every decade, one of the many reasons why it's important for everyone to fill out the census is oh. because based on the number of of people you have in your your district and in your state, uh, it will be determined how many how much congressional representation you get. And and now, infamously, it was eighty nine people. Yes, the, the margin was eighty nine people. If eighty nine people had just more people had just filled out their census, we would not have lost any congressional seats in the state of New York. Um, and, and, and so it's devastating. I, I mean, I don't know what the Independent Redistricting Commission will do. No way, if anyone tells you what, they, what, what the commission will do, that, you know, I, I would take it with a grain of salt because uh, the commission hasn't done it yet. And it's a commission comprised of Republicans, Democrats, and unaffiliated people. Uh, and so it remains to be seen which districts, uh, you know, will, will, will change, uh, whether any will just be outright eliminated uh, and for that reason, I'm, I'm not waiting until the last minute to start, you know, preparing for re-election. i um, speaking for myself um, in, in, in terms of, um, you know, the conversations I've been having with supporters. Um, it is important that we keep the incredible representation that uh, are being provided by, by Democratic representatives in Congress on, for New York. I mean, there's, there's been so much fanfare about uh, the addition of myself and Jamal and, and Richie to um, to the delegation. Well, now, now, now let's, you know, let's help keep us here so we can continue to be a, a strong voice for New Yorkers and for the LGBTQ plus community and, and for the black and brown communities in this country and uh, just for so many other marginalized groups uh, and, and just for Americans writ large because, you know, if you care about our democracy, I think you want to have people like us leading the charge to save our democracy, uh, especially given what's happening on the other side. Yeah, completely. I think um, um, uh, to our earlier discussion, without without passing an HR one S one, um, among other things, um, this is going to be more and more difficult. I think it becomes essentially a white minority government, um, um, and is arguably in some re in some important respects that now, if you look at who has the opportunity to vote and who doesn't. Um, um, just in terms of say key goals for you in this first term, um, key bits of list legislation. We've talked, I think, about some of them, which I'm going to assume are, are, are in that. But then the inter intersection with President Biden's agenda, um, which some of your best friends um, have also supported. So um, Senator Elizabeth Warren, um, early supporter of yours. She endorsed you in, early in your primary, um, got up got out in front and said, I want to see Mondaire Jones in the 17th district in New York. Um, the two of you just in the last week uh, joined forces to co-sponsor um, the, well, essentially President Biden's American Family Plan, but most specifically universal childcare, um, early childhood education. Talk a little bit about, about that and then how that fits and maybe a, a few a few of your other sort of key legislative goals in this term. Um, well, let, let me just say that what, what the president has proposed uh, in the form of the American Families Plan is, uh, is, it, is itself transformative for a sitting president of the United States, right? It is a recognition that uh, building back better uh, and, and infrastructure generally must include child care um, and, and early education uh, and, and higher education, right? I mean, as the president has proposed uh, tuition-free community college, free community colleges, uh, which is something I'm supportive of. Of course, I go further. I think we should do tuition-free public colleges and universities. Uh, so too, with respect to child care, he has proposed $225 billion 
uh, to expand child care opportunities, to make child care affordable in this country. Senator Elizabeth Warren and I introduced the Universal Child Care and Early Learning Act, which would be a $700 billion investment in both child care and early learning. And we know that a lot of early learning occurs in the child care context if it's, if it's quality child care, right? Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I, as a member of the House Education and Labor Committee, I, I'm going to be marking up along with my colleagues, um, you know, uh, the, the, the final bill. And I'm, I'm hoping to secure a larger investment. Uh, and the fact is that for too many Americans in this country, child care is unaffordable. Uh, and also either because of that inaccessible or because literally there are childcare deserts in this country, all throughout this country, uh, inaccessible for that reason as well. Uh, our bill would, if you make up to 200% of the federal poverty line, uh, ensure that you have free childcare in this country. Uh, and anyone who makes more than that would see the cost of childcare that they pay on an annual basis capped at 7% of their household income. Uh, that would be revolutionary. It would also uh, significantly invest in child care and early learning centers to address the issue of child care deserts and also in some instances this, the, the deficiencies that existing uh, that existing centers have. Um, you, it would it would pay child care providers what similarly credentialed public uh, by the way overwhelmingly women of color uh, what yeah. similarly credentialed public school teachers are receiving in compensation. Um, because we know that, like, as I mentioned, so much early learning and, and just development uh, happens at, at the child care stage, uh, and it needs to be treated as, as important as, uh, as, formal, as formal education and K-12 through education. Um, and of course, everyone deserves to live in dignity. So I'm extremely excited about this. Uh, this comes on the cusp of having passed the American Rescue Plan, the most transformative economic legislation for working people in a generation. We are literally cutting child poverty in half with the American Rescue Plan through the expanded uh, refundable and cash advanced starting in July child tax credit. Um, your over colleagues 100 are looking, your colleagues, um, the chair, of course, of Ways and Means has just remarked on how he's looking to make that permanent, um, uh, which would be speaking of transformative, uh, wholly transformative. Absolutely. And I'm so I'm so glad to hear Richie Neal, the chair of the House Ways and Committee, say that. Obviously, Richie Torres, uh, my friend and colleague, has, has, been, has been a leader on the issue of making the child tax credit permanent. We have to do that. We have to do that. It should not be that we are reauthorizing these, you know, these, these, these right. programs like every five years or so. I mean, let's make it permanent so we don't have to wonder what's going to happen in 2025, depending on who has control of Congress. Or let's, let's ensure permanently that people can live in dignity in this country. Uh, and then, of course, we have to end all childhood poverty, right? I mean, because the child tax credit cuts it in, will cut it in half. But we need to end all child poverty in the richest nation in the history of the world. So I'm just excited to be in partnership with the president who actually cares about all Americans, who is working in earnest uh, successfully to meet the scale of the crisis that we face um, that, that pre-existed Donald Trump, by the way. That's why we have to not just build back, but build back better. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm really proud to be joined by people, you know, not just progressives, but moderates who also care about this stuff in, 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 the, in the Democratic caucus. Um, just among your sort of key goals, um, any, any others that we haven't mentioned that you'd like to talk about a bit and why you think they're important for you, your district, and for New York, particularly the New York's LGBTQ community? I, I think we must continue to lift up the intersectional experience that members of the LGBTQ plus community have. Um, you know, I, I sort of laid out that, um, or at least alluded to the fact that it's, you know, it's not enough just to secure marriage equality, right? I mean, we, we have to make sure that, that problems that particularly afflict, like substantive problems that particularly afflict the LGBTQ plus community, including LGBTQ plus people of color, uh, for which, you know, every crisis is worse. <laughs> um, it, uh, are, are, are able to have the, the, receive the sort of structural relief that they need, right? And so I mentioned homelessness, um, and I mentioned student debt, um, and, and we know that uh, the the single payer Medicare for all 
uh, health care proposal that I support would literally ensure everybody in this country has health care. That would be transformative for the LGBTQ community. Having the cost of prescription drugs at $200 on an annual basis. Well, just think of the oh economic God. impact. Just think of the economic impact, what it frees up in the same way in which canceling student debt, the 50, first $50,000 of student debt, if you can't cancel at all, would free up. What, what that would do in an economic sense um, for folks and what, where they would then choose to, to use their financial resources. Absolutely. You, you'd have a, a healthier workforce. You'd have a workforce free to, um, uh, to, to engage in entrepreneurship, to take risks, mm -hmm. to found companies, uh, to own homes, the single biggest generator of wealth in this country. Let's, let's, let's end this racial wealth gap that we have. Yes. Um, you know, let's, let's make sure that people who have COVID aren't wondering about whether they're going to get hit with a bill yeah. uh, if they go get treated. Yeah. You know, and let's ensure that that women can um, participate in the, in the workforce uh, rather than have to stay home and, and take care of their children. We know that overwhelmingly people who are providing child care are women in this country. That's not fair. Um, before we end, I want to get to some personal stuff because why not? Um, so, um, so I know that you're not a complete newcomer to DC. You previously had you know worked in the Obama administration and so forth, but um, um, so, you know, when I interviewed um, uh, Richie, you know, for him, it was like a whole new ball game. You know, he had, had never worked in D.C. But I, I just recently got married to a man from D.C. just a few weeks ago. And so if you need help, you know, in social life or, you know, if you want to talk to us a little bit about what your, your, your social life is like, you know, we can certainly, the gays can help you with your dating life if you need. Um, so there's that. But I also wanted to ask you about Nancy Pelosi's shoes. So do you have an, I mean, I know that you meet with her now, you're in leadership. You know, she's, she's got some very fine footwear and just yesterday, her own Instagram posting from the staff were like the yellow shoes. Um, so so um, uh, any thoughts on any of that? <laughs> well, I, I, I welcome the, uh, the, the dating help. Uh, you know, it, COVID has really, both COVID has really done a number on um, on the social life of of, of, of New York's uh, newest member of Congress, <laughs> and so <laughs> um, so we'll you know we'll, we'll, we'll see as, as society reopens, uh, especially the spring and summer. Um, I think you know I, I can help with this. I think our membership can weigh in with opportunities. Um, and, and uh, you know, Speaker Pelosi dresses very well, obviously. Uh, I, I, I never see the shoes because we're, we're, we're always on Zoom these days and we're not on the House floor, no. but. <laughs> yes. I got to so you just mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, always, I'm always impressed that she can, you, can wear those heels and walk on those slippery corridors. I think without falling down. Um, so not only are they cute, she could actually walk in them. Um, so anyway, enough of Nancy's shoes. Um, Mondair, uh, Congressman Jones, it was such a pleasure. Um, thank you so much. Uh, uh, any, any final words? Uh, likewise, thank you for the invitation. And, and you know, don't be a stranger. I, I, I love the work that your organization does. Um, I see Ahmed is back on here. Thank you, sir, for, for the work that you've been doing to put this together. And um, just know that, you know, you, you have some new advocates in Congress uh, on behalf of our community. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to uh, be leading in a way that until recently I did not think possible. And uh, we just ask that you continue to fight alongside me and, and, and uh, continue to support me. We're proud and we'll absolutely be in touch. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. Thank you both, Congressman Jones, Dan, um, for that informative. It was giving informative, also coffee chat vibe. I feel like if you guys, as if you don't have anything else on your plate, there's a like podcasting future um, for <laughs> both of you all. Um, I just want to remind folks that this has been recorded. It will be posted to our website and our YouTube page. Um, and a special thanks to our friends at Spectrum for sponsoring this work um, and supporting LGBTQ issues and organizing across New York State. I wish everyone a happy Thursday afternoon, a great weekend. Um, try to enjoy the weather. I know I will. Um, and yeah, be blessed everyone. Take care.
All right. Take care. Thanks. Thank you.